Hello, everyone, and welcome to Church Militant's Marian Moments. I'm Michael Voris, our show that we are producing for you every day at 1 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, during the Wuhan virus to give you a, a little spiritual booster shot, as we say, thinking about uh, things eternal uh, as opposed to constantly thinking about nothing but the virus and unemployment and all of those sorts of things. So again, this is just, uh, it's not a Catholic take on the Wuhan, it's taking advantage of the Wuhan to kind of spend some more time on theological, spiritual, devotional concerns. We've called the show Marian Moments because we are focusing on the many things of our Blessed Mother, all the glories of the faith as they surround her and relate to her, which is just about every glory of the faith that there is. Uh, so we have built the show around this little book uh, as a way to uh, help you, to encourage you uh, to pick up one little extra, this is less than one minute, uh, devotion is probably closer to 45 seconds uh, devotion uh, to our Blessed Blessed Mother. It is a very, uh, uh, it's a very helpful uh, way. It's all 365 days of the year are in that book. There is a scripture passage, a reflection from a saint of the day, uh, and normally a saint of the day, and uh, and then a prayer. So let's go to today's uh, April 30th. You have remitted the guilt of your people. You have forgiven all their sins. You have held back all your wrath. You have not lashed out with anger, the 85th Psalm. And today is the feast day of Pope St. Pius V, so the reflection is from him. Mary, ever virgin, is a true mother of mercy who disposes Jesus to clemency. As a consoler of the human race, she never ceases to pour out before him her prayer for the salvation of the faithful, crushed by the weight of their sins. Again, Pope Pius there, Pope St. Pius uh, stressing the maternity of our Blessed Mother, not just of our Lord, uh, but also of the offspring, her all her offspring, so that Jesus as judge and she as mother of mercy may always kind of be tugging at his robe saying, now be merciful, be merciful, because that's what moms do, God bless moms, especially that mom. <laughs> and our prayer then, O Mary, you continually plead for us before the throne of your divine son, Help me to show my gratitude for his mercy toward me by striving to avoid all sin in the future. Amen. Amen. Thank the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if you remember, uh, if you're new to joining us, we're covering the, the uh, topic of topology, typology, which is the uh, studying of how the Old Testament relates to the New. St. Augustine made the famous comment, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old is fully revealed in the New. So there's a relationship between them, uh, and uh, we started this discussion pointing to the relationship between, for example, Adam and Christ. St. Paul is the one who sort of starts the ball rolling on this topic of typology. He says, you know, that uh, our Lord is the new Adam. Uh, so you find something in the old that is a prefigurement or a foreshadowing of something that's going to be fully revealed uh, in the new. Uh, actually, I was talking with a couple guys here earlier this morning, and we're saying this is kind of fun how all this stuff sort of fits together. And you know, hasn't God done a wonderful job with this? And my smart Alec, he said, well, he's reverse engineering it. You know, since he's outside of time, he already knows how it's going to end. So he has the ending, and then he just goes backwards in time and sets everything up in advance. So anyway, I, I you know, it's probably not a good thing to be very smart alecky with God. Uh, but anyway, it's our discussions we have around here. So one of the things we're looking at right now is how the Ark of the Covenant, and this week we're looking at this, the Ark of the Covenant is a type for our Blessed Mother. Just by very quick review, uh, the Ark is fashioned by the exact explicit instructions of the Lord God at the base of Mount Sinai to Moses into the Ark, uh, which is made of acacia wood, which is uh, considered indestructible. It is lined with pure gold, Pure, the, the uh, uh, Hebrew word there used for pure means completely uncorrupted. Uh, and then into it go uh, the Ten Commandments, the uh, staff of Aaron, the high priest, and the uh, manna from the, uh, the, with the Jews are being fed in the desert uh, by the Lord God. Lid goes on it. Tabernacle goes in, I'm sorry, the Ark of the Covenant goes into the tabernacle, which as they were wandering around in the desert for 40 years, uh, was a big tent. And that combination of the tabernacle containing the word of God inside 
the, I'm sorry, the Ark of the Covenant containing the word of God inside the tabernacle, God says of himself that will be his dwelling place and the Ark is where he will meet his people. Uh, so we, it's a very quick review of what we've done so far, just in case you weren't joining us earlier, earlier in the week for those. They get to the Holy Land. Moses is buried on Mount Nebo. They go to, into the Holy Land. They're marching around there for roughly you know, 400 years or so, clearing the land, fighting all the various tribes, the Philistines, all that stuff. They claim, finally claim possession of the Holy Land around the year 1000 uh, when King David's era begins, and that's where we'll pick up today. King David was, uh, you know, just consumed by the idea that the ark, which is the sort of central point of the focus of Jewish worship, uh, of Jewish life and concentration, wherever, whenever they were camped somewhere, the cloud, the glory cloud is what they called it, would sort of descend over the tent, the tabernacle, where the ark of the covenant was, and that would signal to them that God was with them there. So wherever the cloud comes, wherever the cloud of glory comes, is where God is meeting his people. So that's going on for, you know, right up to the time, obviously, of David. And then David becomes, you know, not, uh, you know, consumed with the idea of wanting to find a kind of permanent home uh, for this. He wants to build a magnificent structure for God and all of that. And this is captured in Psalm 132 here. Part of it is, I will not enter the house where I live, nor lie on the couch where I sleep. I will give my eyes no sleep, my eyelids no rest, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. And, uh, you know, when you think about David's history, and that's you know beautiful shot there. Of the you see the harp underneath the words on the left because you know many of the psalms obviously written by David on the harp. Uh, you know these were all the psalms were songs. Uh, they were set to tunes. We have no idea what the actual melody of them were uh, of, of you know what they had, but uh, he, David was always singing. Uh, to God and singing out his prayers of whatever, lamentation, great joy, frustration, whatever it is. It's really, uh, it's kind of an interesting thought when you think about the personalities involved here. You know, David, God said of David, he's the apple of my eye. Uh, and yet David runs off and, you know, commits adultery with Bathsheba, has her husband, Uriah, kills sent off to the battle front lines, orders the lines to withdraw. So he's there by himself. He gets killed. Uh, and yet uh, here is this longing uh, on the part of David uh, to in the midst, even though all that had happened and he was forgiven for it, he had to pay the price for it. God said, you know, you're forgiven, your sin is forgiven, but uh, to pay for your sin, I shall kill your son uh, who's been conceived. I'll kill the child who was conceived illegitimately with, uh, uh, with Bathsheba. Um, so it's all the give and take of all of these relationships that, you know, fallen humans have with uh, with our Lord and how patient uh, our Lord just, but also merc merciful he is. So David wants to build a thing. That's a wonderful example of it. David is not actually the one who builds the temple. However, the temple is built by, uh, excuse me, is built by his son Solomon. Uh, we have a little interesting thing here. Of what uh, it, it, We're going to sort of follow the narrative of the ark and as, just as by way of review here for a moment. We have... Uh, as we follow the ark along, uh, go ahead and bring up the next one, guys. Um, as we say, they're traveling through the desert. They eventually get to the city of David. The city of David, by the way, is not, uh, is not Jerusalem. It's right by modern-day Jerusalem, but it was a smaller encampment that uh, the Jerusalem, as we kind of know and understand the walls and all that, was like a multi-decade, multi-century uh, process, but uh, it was Solomon who built the temple, which is the background of that picture there. The final resting place is in the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. And I think there's one more, is there not? Am I wrong here? Oh, so let me give you a little temple history very quickly here. So there were the 12 tribes of Israel. This is around the year 900 BC. Solomon becomes 950 BC. Solomon becomes king. Uh, and he wants to carry on what uh, his father, King David, wanted to do, uh, which is build this tremendous temple and put the Holy of Holies in it. Of course, the Lord God again describes how this will all be built. Uh, Solomon sets about building it, 
And many people don't know that it was actually what caused the split within the 12 tribes of Israel, the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes. Two southern tribes are uh, Judah and Benjamin, those two southern tribes in Jerusalem. Uh, but the 10 northern tribes start to get uh, ticked off because Solomon is taxing the living daylights out of them in order to pay for the temple to be built in the south in Jerusalem. And that just creates an awful lot of very bad blood. And when Solomon dies, the 10 tribes in the north split off. Uh, and they are properly referred to as Israel. I mean, all of it's kind of Israel, but those 10 tribes specifically are referred to as Israel. And uh, during the uh, uh, Assyrian assault that wipes out Israel and the 10 tribes are taken off into slavery or wherever they went, uh, and they're lost. And when we're talking about the 10 lost tribes of Israel, we're talking about those 10 northern tribes, the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, so that all that remains of sort of Judaism, uh, the, the Jewish nation, so to speak, are just those two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and they're just sitting down the south and Jerusalem's kind of in the middle of them. The Jewish character to a degree remains in that, in that geographical region of what was the 10 tribes, but they intermarry with all sorts of you know, local uh, you know, pagan uh, uh, followers of you know, paganism and this, that, and the other, and, and all the prophets keep getting sent to them. You know, I'll keep getting sent to them saying, you know, you know, come back to the Lord God. You know, you're, you're going off stray. You know, you're, you're losing your identity, la, la, and all that. And, uh, and eventually they're destroyed by the Assyrians. Um, and that goes up to roughly about the year 750 uh, B.C. Uh, and then the lost tribes are taken away, and that is it. So what happens with the ark? Uh, when we come down to the question of... Uh, you know, so the south, the two southern kingdoms remain uh, faithful, more or less, for roughly another couple hundred years or so. But then the Babylonians come sweeping in, and, uh, they're, and all of a sudden, it's gone. So where is the ark? Remember, it's sitting in the Holy of Holies in the temple. So there's a number of these questions here. Where is the ark? Here are some theories. The Babylonian conquest, the Babylonians took it off took it back to Babylon with them, and it's just lost to history. Well, there is a big list in the Old Testament of the various things they took, some of them pretty important things. Nowhere in any list does it say they took the Ark of the Covenant with them. Uh, somebody else says that it was, it's just been hidden away somewhere waiting discovery. That was the whole premise, you'll remember, of Indiana Jones, the first movie. Indiana Jones and the, and the Lost Ark, is that what it is? Lost Ark in the Ark, whatever. I can't remember the name of the movie. Anyway, that movie, the famous movie. Another one, believe it or not, is that there are some Ethiopian monks in Ethiopia who actually have this hidden away in a monastery and they're guarding it, but uh, only members of the monk community are allowed to go in and look at it. So that's their claim, but no one has ever seen it. They've never proven it, so you, know, you just can't get in. There's no entrance into it. So that is the, uh, uh, those are some sort of extant theories. There it is. It's either lost to history, it's stuck away somewhere waiting for Indiana Jones to find it, uh, or it's over there in Ethiopia somewhere hidden away uh, that you can't get access to. Uh, and here is a very interesting point. If you have a Catholic Bible, which has 73 books in it, as opposed to a Protestant Bible that has only 66 books in it, uh, seven of the books that were tossed out by Martin Luther, uh, because they, they presented things that disagreed with his uh, errant theology, uh, he created what was in essence a new Bible, uh, certainly a re redacted, revised Bible, Many, many Protestants don't, can't answer the question, almost unless they're scholars of some sort and they have studied a Catholic Bible, they can't answer the question of where the Ark is. Uh, but we can. We know exactly where the Ark is because in one of the books that Martin Luther tossed out, uh, there's two, First and Second Maccabees, there's a description in there of precisely where the Ark was taken to. And we've got it uh, uh, sitting up here. So the Ark is, where is the Ark? Well, it says, the prophet Jeremiah takes it just before the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. That was in 587 BC when the Babylonians swept in and destroyed Jerusalem. It says also that it was hidden away in a cave on Mount Nebo, which is where Moses was buried. So it was kind of going back to the, uh, the very person who was in charge of crafting it you know, 400 years later. 
Um, and then one more point, I believe, right? Nope, that's it. Okay, so the scripture account of all of this is in 2 Maccabees. And let's put that up, guys. We'll go through this. <clears throat> this is where that information comes from. It's from 2 Maccabees uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. The prophet, and the prophet here is Jeremiah, the prophet, <clears throat> in virtue of an oracle, meaning God told him, ordered that the tent and the ark should accompany him and he went to the very mountain that Moses climbed to behold God's inheritance. That's Nebo, and they all understood that. When Jeremiah arrived there, he found a chamber in a cave in which he put the tent, the ark, and the altar of incense. Then he sealed the entrance. Some of those who followed him came up intending to mark the path, but they couldn't find it. When Jeremiah heard of this, he reproved them. The place is to remain unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows them mercy. Then the Lord will disclose these things. And the glory of the Lord and the cloud will be seen just as they appeared in the time of Moses and Solomon when he prayed that the place might be greatly sanctified. Now, why is it important to kind of understand all of that? Uh, because it, show, it shows you that the ark is not just being hidden away somewhere, uh, and that's it. That there is a future uh, life of the ark where it will become clear once again uh, that the ark is... Um, uh, that the ark is where God's dwelling occurs. Now, remember, there's this glory cloud uh, that descends on the tabernacle where the ark is. So the, the tent is the dwelling place of God, and the ark inside the tent is where God meets his people. And you know that when the cloud descends that God is present. Uh, tipping the hand a little bit for tomorrow, let's fast forward these 500, 600 years, let's fast forward to a little town called Nazareth, and there is a virgin by the name of Mary, and the angel has just told her, sent by God, that she is about to conceive a son. Uh, and she says, how can this be, since I do not know man? And the angel, speaking on behalf of the Lord God, says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That is a direct reference to the ark, because that is what happened throughout all of Jewish history. So the ark itself is gone, the box is gone, it has served its purpose. It did what it was supposed to do. Now we have moved into the period of the New Testament, the New Covenant. And then everything that was there, placed there by God as a prefigurement, a foreshadowing, a hint, a clue of what was coming, now needs to be fulfilled. And so now there needs to be the new ark because we're in the New Covenant and Jesus is the new Moses. Um, and if you think about this for a moment, this is the very first time there in Nazareth that we have any explicit reference to God as a trinity. And it's revealed, first of all, to Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Third person, first person. Hence, the child to be born to you will be called the Son of God. One, two, three, there it is, the Holy Trinity right there for the first time explicitly laid out and the, the, I mean, they all have the same role, they all act together, but there are certain things as we look at them in time where one does one thing and one does another. Uh, they're all, of course, acting together. It's not like, you know, one's off on a vacation somewhere and the other two are busy working, doing overtime, but they're all together, you know, perfecting the same work, uh, but there are some things that are proper to one uh, in their actions. So, you know, the Holy Spirit did not incarnate. Uh, God the Father did not incarnate, but God did incarnate 
uh, through the second person in the womb of our Blessed Mother. So Mary becomes the new ark where God comes to meet his people. It's no longer just stone tablets, word of God. It is actually the word, the logos of God inside this new ark. And the priesthood <clears throat> is there because this is the high priest. And the living bread come down from heaven uh, as the manna in the desert is now present there in the ark as the living bread come down from heaven, as he says, as he'll say 32, 33 years later in Capernaum, uh, just before Passover. Uh, so uh, I hope these little, uh, you know, kind of in-depth, deep dives uh, into all of this is, is, is helpful. I mean, not every single thing is so, you know, uh, devotionally, you know, gives you, you know, tingles all over. It's just, you know, you have to know the faith so that you can begin to appreciate some of the prayers, for example, and some of the devotions that we have and why the church teaches what it does. Most of you watching this show probably could say, yeah, the church teaches that you know, Our Lady is you know, immaculately conceived and uh, you know, you know, assumed into heaven, body, and soul, and she's Mother God and perpetually virgin. I mean, you could probably say all of that. You know that. But there's a there's a difference between knowing and then spending time reflecting on deep and starting to see all of the dots, everything connected, how everything is brought together. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the, I mean, the Psalms that, you know, I'm looking for a dwelling place, looking for a place uh, for God to dwell among his people. David writes that in the year 1000 BC, a thousand years before this event in Nazareth. And yet, you know, it's fulfilled in Nazareth. Uh, and, you know, so we, we went down this whole typology thing because earlier we were talking about the historical biblical critics uh, who are trying to rip scripture apart and say, well, this isn't true, that's not true, this is not true. So in the counter against that historical biblical criticism, you start to find out even more things. It's always good to have things challenged. It forces you to go back to square one and re-examine things and in that process you learn more of the truth deeper truths uh, than you might otherwise have been forced to learn you just kind of accept things and move on so it is the the catholic intellectual tradition is very rich and very very pronounced throughout all of the 2000 years of sacred history and you know we're happy to be able to share some of that with you here in these little brief you know 10 15 minute whatever it is uh, little presentations just to get you thinking, just to get you thinking. And then when you see the prayers that we put up here in the Mary Day by Day book each day, you can start to see how some of these truths have worked their way into the prayers of the church. And that's the whole point. What you know goes to your heart, your heart expresses in prayer the truth, you live a life accordingly. All of this is what we mean by integrity. So hope you're, uh, hope you're enjoying all of these. I, I know sometimes they start to get a little professorial, cause, but that's just the nature of it. Uh, it's the nature of it. You, you gotta study the data, but you don't remain in the data. You see how the data actually uh, and, uh, uh, and illumines your soul. So you gotta have the data, we're in time and space, you gotta read the stuff, you gotta go through, look at it, write notes, study, 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 and then you learn it, but then you, learn it. Not just your brain, you, body and soul, learn it. All right, let's go to some questions we take. First one, it looks like the College of Cardinals is stacked in favor of the liberals for the next papal conclave. What are your thoughts? My first thought is, I hope that's wrong. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't think it is wrong. Uh, there, there's no doubt that, uh, there's no doubt that a number of the uh, appointments that Pope Francis has made, which is now over half of the voting age cardinals uh, for the next conclave. Uh, the ones that are more notable uh, all certainly seem to be in his mold, uh, you know, to one degree or another. Uh, you know, that isn't to say that, you know, isn't to say that somebody becomes Pope and through grace of office something changes or, you know, whatever. Uh, but, um, yeah, and it, is, it also is not to say that whoever walks into, their, walks into the conclave as a pope comes out, won't come out a cardinal. That's a very famous expression uh, in the church. You know, he who goes into the conclave a pope walks out a cardinal, meaning the favorite guy didn't, didn't win election. Uh, but 
Uh, I will say that this is probably, in the history of the church, this is probably one of the very most, the next conclave is probably one of the very most important because the church is on such uh, shaky footings right now, not the church in her uh, integral purity, but the church, the lived life of the church on the parish level and all of this is on such shaky footings right now uh, that um, you know, a pope uh, sort of in the mold of Francis, Pope Francis, uh, who comes along again and has all these kind of, you know, ambiguous, uh, you know, can't quite figure out what's going on, these weird interviews with, you know, atheists, you know, 100-year-old atheist reporters where he says something and then the Pope never really denies it, but the Vatican issues, he's wishy-washy, well, no, he didn't really mean that, and, uh, and you know, uh, these alignments with globalism and the globalist crowd and the Marxist in China and all of this stuff. And there's just nothing ever clear. That's the problem. Nothing is ever clearly stated. There's just, uh, you know, unless you're a faithful Catholic, at which point you're a barbarian or a neo-Pelagian or whatever. But aside from that, uh, nothing's ever clearly said. So there's this reign of confusion. Um, if that is the uh, management style of whoever happens to become the next pope. Uh, this is not going to be solved uh, on a human level. This is not going to be solved for a very long time because that next pope will bring in cardinals, make increase the College of Cardinals with people cast in his own image. This all messed up uh, in the time, uh, actually to a degree, the time even before Vatican II. There were a lot of sympathetic uh, naive uh, men who were cardinals and archbishops and so forth at the Second Vatican Council uh, who didn't really quite understand what was going on. Some of them did and some of them were part of it, uh, but there were a lot of them were just kind of naive and just sort of floating along, you know, the fumes of, of Catholicism's 2,000 years and not really paying attention to things. And you got to always be vigilant with the faith. Uh, so, uh, and as for my thoughts, those are my thoughts. I, I, uh, I'm Irish, so I'm not like, you know, the, the guy who never wants to deal with the reality, the sad reality of things. It's kind of part of the Irish nature to look things right in the face and say, yep, this sucks, this is going to be bad, even when it might not be that bad, but it's just kind of the disposition. But on a human level, I don't know. I mean, the same thing I would say if, like, Joe Biden wins, you know, presuming he remains the nominee and the favorite and he gets, you know, he's the nominee, I mean, there are going to be some tough days ahead if uh, Joe Biden, for Catholics, if, uh, if, if Joe Biden wins the White House. That will be an absolute disaster. So anyway, next question. How can Catholics fulfill their Sunday obligations in this current climate? Is live streaming mass necessary? Okay, two different questions here. First of all, the... Uh, it is the, the second commandment does not say thou shalt go to mass on Sunday. It says thou shalt keep holy the Lord's day. The church has said the way that is done, if you, us, we, the laity can do it, is that you must attend mass and that is the supreme uh, uh, worship that we as lay Catholics and priests too, but can give to God the Father, because it is Calvary reenacted again, or you know, re bad phrase, whatever, the representation uh, of the once for all sacrifice, and we get to participate in that. Uh, and so that is the worship, uh, that is the highest form of worship there can be. However, if we are unable to go, and let's not talk about the whole Wuhan thing for a moment, let's skip over and just take a practical example that some of us here in the studio found ourselves in on you know, a number of occasions. Uh, we've had to uh, be traveling, and uh, I, I think two or three times, just because of the way the flights worked, uh, and myself and a couple of crew guys here have been caught in the air <laughs> on the way to either uh, Sydney, Australia, or Auckland, New Zealand. And we've crossed over the international timeline, so we left on Saturday uh, from here and then to LAX and fly over. And then as we fly over, Sunday comes and Sunday goes, and then we land on Monday. 
Uh, so nothing happened I mean, in the air. We were up there for whatever, 29,000 hours is what it feels like that you're up there for. So what do you do in that case? Well, I mean, you can't obviously go to mass unless you happen to have a priest sitting next to you and he pulls down his tray and says mass right there in the, in the middle seat. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you have to somehow, so, you know, we would say an extra rosary, the gang, or, you know, personally, privately, if we're sitting together, sitting apart, do some extra prayers there, that sort of thing. Somehow you have to mark the day. Uh, and it has to be a, a, a holy treatment of the Lord's day. Uh, normally, outside of the Wuhan mess, that's easy. You go to Mass. That's it. Uh, however, when you move into the situation where uh, you can't go to Mass, okay, now you should try to do whatever the next best thing is. So I don't want to say that watching a live stream of Mass is necessary, because that all of a sudden makes it seem like going to Mass is necessary. Mass is only necessary if you can attend. So what happens if somebody doesn't have an internet connection? What happens if they're sitting there doing something and their computer garbage is out? I mean, these are things that happen. So uh, what is necessary, the commandment, is that you keep the Lord's day holy. So, uh, you know, if there are extra prayers that you are saying, if there's some way you're, you're raising up Sunday from all the other days of the week, should be holy on all the days, but on this day in particular, if you can watch uh, a live stream of Mass and participate to the best of your ability, you aren't present to the Mass in the way that we would normally understand a presence. You are, you are viewing the Mass and you are participating in spirit and in your heart. And right now, that's the best you can do. So if you can do that, you should do that. Uh, but I wouldn't leave it at that. If there's other things you can do or say or pray during the uh, on Sunday because it's Sunday, that's good. Say, uh, you know, maybe perhaps an extra rosary, uh, spend 15 minutes in, uh, you know, a time, over and above what you might normally do in, uh, in some prayer, uh, reading scripture, something like that. Uh, so mark the day and make it holy. It hasn't been taken away from us through any fault of our own, at least not directly. Uh, so we just have to compensate as best we can. In Japan, in Nagasaki, uh, the Catholic community there was deprived of a priest for 400 years. They had no mass. They had no priest. The only thing they could do was baptize their children, the lay people there. They had, they had none of the sacraments in the normal sense of the sacraments for four centuries uh, uh, and until the uh, until World War II, they were just sort of locked away and, and you know key thrown away uh, in the uh, island and empire of Japan. So you know if you have children, the day should be spent in a way that you know uh, uh, is able to teach them at whatever level they're at something more about the faith. Uh, you know you have to carry on the faith. The faith is you know Saint John Paul said the domestic church, the family is the first church. Uh, and that's where, on, at least on that level, we have to try to continue on as best we can. And hopefully the idea of you know, being shut out of the churches will be uh, over shortly. Uh, it seems to be that way in a number of states uh, already. Hopefully this is over with fast. But there's going to be an awful lot of questions and soul searching when this is done. And was this done correctly? And how could we have done this? And you know, wh wh why was this outrageous thing jumped to immediately? Like the very last thing you could do became the first thing you should do. And you know, bishops, what's wrong with you? Why did you do this? Why did some of you tell your priests not even to live stream masses? You know, one priest sitting in his, his rectory chapel or in the church and you know, really? Well, I mean, what's the big deal with that? I mean, some of you were shutting down drive-through confessions. You wouldn't allow cars. You wouldn't allow cars to pull into a parking lot uh, where you know, and everybody's got their windows up. Uh, one place had a—I uh, I can't remember where the, what diocese it was—but they had the uh, the ability to tune into their radio, uh, their car radio, and listen to the mass because some ingenious, you know, probably twenty-year-old, twenty-something, set that up uh, outside. And uh, the bishop shut it down. Why would you do that? So there's a lot of things. Granted, this kind of got sprung on everybody just all of a sudden. The nation's in an emergency disaster, and it's, what are we going to do here? And, you know, state of emergency, shut everything down. And, you know, there wasn't an awful lot of time to think of this ahead of time. But during these six, seven, eight weeks, 
there have been an awful lot of things that have arisen, and I think a lot of faithful Catholics are extraordinarily disappointed uh, in, in how the bishops approached this and even how some of their own pastors uh, approached it. It looked like they didn't kind of believe a lot of things. So uh, anyway, keep holy the Lord's Day as best you can. If you can attend, I'm putting that in quotes, mass, live stream, you should. Next question, last question. I think last question. Is sacrifice necessary for religion? Absolutely. The word religion comes from the Latin word religio, religio, which means to bind, to tie. So as in like your wrists are tied together uh, and you don't get to do everything you want to do. You're bound to uh, a set of beliefs and customs which dictate a way you live. So on that even most foundational level of sacrifice, what is a sacrifice? Uh, a sacrifice uh, in its most basic sense is just exchanging one thing for another. That's what a sacrifice is. I give up this, I sacrifice this so that I may have that. So, you know, you don't see this on the shot very clear, but here's our wonderful sword of St. Michael. Okay, so in order to get this, I had to sacrifice some money from, the, uh, from my account uh, in 2006, I believe this was, uh, to sacrifice some money from my account and get this, but this is what I wanted. And I was willing to sacrifice the, uh, the few hundred bucks in my account in order to get that. So I made an exchange. So yeah, uh, religion is all about that. You are exchanging, you know, even the you know, caveman gods or you know, whatever, the ancient gods of Egypt, the, the Mayan civilizations, they were always sacrificing something. The Jews are sacrificing lambs left and right. Everybody was always sacrificing something understanding that you were praying to the, you know, in the pagan world, the deities of whatever, and you would like chop up people's heads and throw their bodies into the fire or, you know, whatever. You were sacrificing life, their life, for, so God would give you, your fake God would give you life. Well, that was also going on, except not with humans, uh, with the Jews. They would, they would kill the lamb, sacrifice the life of the lamb so that God, as recognition uh, of the truth, that they were completely reliant on God. Uh, so yeah, sacrifice and religion are intimately bound up. If you move into sort of 21st century Western civilization now, almost completely devoid of any of its Christian roots and Christian heritage, religion, the idea of sacrifice that goes along with that has been completely replaced by, well, I'm spiritual and I'm spiritual. I have no idea what that means. The devil is a spirit. Uh, of course you're a spirit. It's a component of what you are. Of course you're spiritual. That's like saying, you know, what's your religion? My religion is I have two legs. Well, of course you have two legs. You're a human. Uh, so it's, uh, but why? Because if you're spiritual and not religious, the notion of sacrifice, having to tailor your life to a set of beliefs, well, it doesn't apply here. You can do whatever you want. Just walk around and say, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual. You're not spiritual, just you're supposed to do something with that spirit, and that spirit is to realize, has been given to you to recognize God, and then in the true religion, Catholicism, submit yourself and grow in holiness to become like God. That's the point of it. I think we have one more question, I think, right? Yeah. Oh boy, what's the difference between salvation and justification? Uh, we could get into a very long, its own show, on this question, I don't mean an episode of Marian Moments, I mean an entirely new program uh, on this question. Uh, the, it, it, Martin Luther came along and completely muddied the waters on this uh, with the Protestant revolt in the 16th century. Uh, I don't want to get into everything that, that Protestantism and Calvinism and the, all that stuff says. Justification and salvation are both bound up together. One is a process of the other in Catholic theology, which is true, and all the others aren't. Uh, justification is something which is granted to you, uh, and you also participate in on your way to salvation. If you commit a mortal sin, you lose your justification in order to return to a state of being justified, which means you are now able to uh, you know, work on your salvation again, because the two fit together. 
uh, you must go to confession, or at, if that's not available to you, then you know you make the a, a, a perfect or good act of contrition, and with the promise and the understanding that the moment you are able to go to confession, you will. Again, that's like the missing mass thing. You don't have a choice. You can't go to mass, so it's not your fault. It's taken away from you. Well, same thing if you're trying to go to confession. If you're trying to go to confession and there's no way for you to go, uh, well, then it's not your fault. So you make an act of contrition uh, with the promise, the understanding that you will go to the sacramental confession as soon as you possibly can. So uh, justification is infused into us at baptism. We are justified. We have the right to begin to operate within the world of, our, uh, of, of being saved, of working on our salvation. As St. Thomas, as St. Paul tells the Philippians, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So it is a process. Justification is a process. They both ultimately lead, because you have to be justified in order to get into heaven, to be saved. So sanctification is the process by which justification is increased. You grow in holiness. God continues to pour graces into a person, to, continues to fill a person up with grace, so to speak. Our Lady, if you notice, when Gabriel comes to her, he says, full of grace. She already has it completely full of grace. We are in the process of being filled up with grace. And that process of that is sanctification, uh, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, all aiming towards uh, our salvation. So uh, hope that's clear. We always wrap up each day with our uh, St. Michael prayer. We'll do that. We'll just join us for chapel tonight, by the way, at 445 for evening prayer. In the meantime, uh, this is the prayer to St. Michael in Latin. We pray it first in English, and then we finish off in Latin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sancta Michael Archangelae, defende nos in prelio contra niquitiam et insidias diabli esto presidium. Imperati lideus, supplicesti precamor, tuque princeps militiae celestis, santa namoliosque spiritus malignos, quiad perditionem animatum pevergantur in mundo, divina virtute in infernum de trude. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tomorrow we will wrap up our conversation on the typology of the Ark of the Covenant being a type for Mary. And it's some kind of cool stuff. So we'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time right here, Church Militant. God love you.